Hi, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the second year that we have the speaker series for the uh, interaction between the Rotman Institute and the Brain and Mind Institute. We're very excited to be starting off uh, again this year. Last year we had uh, two great talks. Um, uh, Alfonso Karamatsa and Patricia Churchland got things started off for us. And uh, this year we have two talks that are going to be on the hippocampus. Uh, so the talk is, uh, the, the speaker series is part of a connection between the Rotman Institute and the Brain and Mind Institute. Um, we have a lot of other activities going on. Several of our graduate students in uh, the Rotman Institute have joined labs in the Brain and Mind Institute. Um, and we share uh, uh, speakers. Uh, we, we have a lot of interactions uh, between the two units and we're hoping that there'll be further collaborations as we go forward. So this speaker series brings in people who uh, are of interest to both units. Um, it's a, a great opportunity for everybody to get together and, and share ideas as well. So to introduce today's speaker, I'm going to have my colleague Jackie Sullivan, who actually works in philosophy of neuroscience, introduce today's speaker. Nonetheless, some critics 
argue that part of representation in the brain is really um, overrated, that, it, that it's just a way of of glossing what goes on in the brain. It's not really an attempt to tell, uh, it's not, there aren't really representations in the brain, but we talk as if there are representations. And that the, the only real account of how the brain uh, carries out information processing is one that just describes the mechanisms, uh, the, the uh, specific processes, uh, and where they're located in the brain, uh, and doesn't uh, traffic in representations. Now, I need a framework to think about representation, and the one I um, um, have gravitated toward is one that situates representations in the context of systems of, of control, control systems, uh, where the controller of a system must both have information about the thing it's going to control, which is commonly referred to as the plant, and then it must be able to use that representation in executing activities in the plan. What I have pictured up there um, on the right uh, is the governor that uh, James Watt developed for the steam engine. Um, he faced a problem, how to regulate the flow of steam in the steam engine so as to keep the machinery operating at a constant rate. He came up with the ingenious device of the centrifugal governor. Uh, basically, the governor is attached to the um, uh, same uh, system as all the appliances, but it's rotating, uh, and depending upon the speed at which uh, the axle is rotating, the arms move in or out, and uh, the question one asks, and then there's a linkage mechanism that connects that back to the uh, uh, steam valve to open or close it. And if you ask yourself, well, why did Watt put this somewhat elaborate um, device into the steam engine? Well, it's because he needed to take the information about the speed the engine was, was rotating at and transform it into a format that, the, uh, that could be used to regulate the um, uh, opening and controlling of the valves. That is, there was a representation created. Now, in arguing that the Watt governor is a representational device, uh, I'm using the word representation in a way that I think many neuroscientists might, might recognize, but it, when, when it was first, when the Watt governor was first introduced into these discussions, it was introduced by Tim Van Gelder as part of an argument that you don't need representations uh, uh, in uh, explaining how dynamical systems work. I'm not going to try to reverse all my arguments uh, against Van Gelder at this point, but I think it is, is in fact, uh, clearly uh, important that this white governor that the angle arms, and it turns out it's not just the angle, but the angle, the uh, uh, velocity and momentum, uh, carry information about the speed of the, of the engine, and that these, these representations, in fact, meet many conditions people expect of representation. We think of representations as possibly misrepresenting. Well, the angle of the angle arms and their movement can, in fact, be uh, 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 generated accurately. They can misrepresent. And moreover, they can be misinterpreted. That is, um, if something is, is transformed about the linkage mechanism, the information won't be consumed in the right way. So my claim is that we should think about the brain and various processes in the brain as control systems and they traffic in representations. The challenge then for my argument is to respond to the claim that, the, that representations uh, only figure in glosses of the uh, uh, activity of the brain, uh, that there are no representations. The way I'm going to press that, rather than just an abstract conceptual argument, is to look at the practice of introducing representations uh, and what I will argue is that, in fact, the claim that a particular brain process is representational is a substantive hypothesis that is, the, that is put forward as, as part of an explanation and is revised over time as the inquiry goes on. The inquiry is directed at saying, okay, have I got correct what this thing represents? Uh, and we're going to look at things like where does it get the information from? Uh, and uh, who is going to be the consumer of this information, and in that process, the account of representation 
gets elaborated, revised, maybe even re uh, one count replaced by another. Uh, and this is not mere glossing of something else. These are the substantive hypotheses uh, that the scientists are advancing in the course of their inquiry. Now, I'm going to do. I'm going to make this case by developing a, a case study. Uh, I'm going to look at a particular group of cells in the um, uh, hippocampus called place cells, and I'll move out beyond that in the end of the talk and start with, with place cells, who are understood to be carrying representations. That is, representations about the place the uh, mammal is in. Uh, I'm going to proceed by first discussing the initial discovery of place cells and the way they were characterized as representational. Then we do uh, research on uh, what's called re uh, uh, remapping that is focused on revising and filling out the account of what it is that place cells actually represent. Eventually, the way in which they were, place cells were thought to represent place became, was revised over time. I would say something about how this research led to a revision in the account of what the vehicle representation was. It wasn't just the activity of place cells, but the particular timing of their activity. And then in the uh, last substantive section, I will uh, I'll show how in recent years, place, cell, place cells have been situated in a broader network of components carrying out different representational functions. In fact, the representational function first assigned to place cells has been transferred to a different set of cells called grid cells. And then a different question, that is, what representational role do place cells play? So the strategy will be through this, through this, through examining this history to show that, in fact, these are substantive hypotheses that the scientists are making that about representation, and just as one would expect of scientific hypotheses, they are advanced, they are put to test, they are revised, uh, until one ends up with today an interesting but probably still to be revised account of how these representations figure in the navigational activity, particularly of roads where most of the study has been done. Okay, just a little bit of background. The hippocampus has long been attractive to researchers because it has such a distinctive architecture. Uh, so even before anybody was thinking in terms of, of uh, memory or of, of spatial representation in the hippocampus, People were examining the architecture of the hippocampus, uh, examining uh, cell phenomena in the architecture in, in the hippocampus. Uh, one of the distinctive, I don't have a pointer, uh, but uh, you can see in uh, uh, yellow in the uh, representation of the uh, rat brain on the, on the right, uh, the hippocampal area, and in the sketch here, if you follow, you can see that there is a loop structure, which I, I abstracted here on the right, that inputs into the hippocampus come from other cortical areas uh, through the parahippocampal and, and parahrhinal cortex to the entorhinal cortex, and then are processed through the regions of the hippocampus. The hippocampus involves the dedicated gyrus, CA3, CA1, and it's a loop passing back to the entorhinal cortex. There are also some shortcuts. I'll talk about one of those later in the talk. Uh, but the hippocampus is a had the architecture that people found quite interesting, uh, and, attract, and people were asking questions like, what would this kind of architecture be useful for processing? By the 1970s, studies in rodents have also shown that if you remove the hippocampus from an animal, uh, its navigational skills are, are critically impaired. It wasn't the only, not the only thing that's transformed, but it was uh, one uh, suggestion that uh, the hippocampus might have something to do with representing space. And in 1971, O'Keefe and Belsky, uh, uh, uh produced the first study recording it from individual hippocampal cells. They were recording from uh, at least three regions of the hippocampus, uh, e.g. CA1 and all the cell in the study, CA4 region. And in their study, uh, they had a rat in, in an enclosure. They uh, reported from 76 neurons, and eight of them, they report, responded solely or maximally 
uh, when the rat uh, was situated in a particular part of the testing platform facing it in a particular direction. There's some noteworthy things about this initial study. Uh, they, the rats responded only when they were oriented in a specific direction. So here you have the rat oriented toward point A, it's at A, and the, and the neuron uh, is spiking. Uh, the neurons for other areas like, like B are not spiking during the period it's there. But it's only while it's actually restrained by a human hand. Um, uh, these are interesting features when you're a historian of science looking to say the initial studies don't, don't fit the way the uh, phenomenon uh, was later described, both that it had to be facing in a particular direction and restrained, but nonetheless, that's how they first characterized these neurons. And they quickly concluded that what these neurons were doing were providing the uh, brain with a spatial reference map. That is, they bring in the language of, of, of a map, in uh, a study a couple of years later, O'Keefe refers to these cells for the first time as place units, and toward the end of the paper actually introduces the language of place cells. So these are cells that are, that are representing, designating places. And in 1978, Ian uh, Lindell published Hippocampus as a cognitive map, in which they uh, construed the hippocampus is providing what's called an allocentric map, much like the map you get from Google. That is, it's a map that you can locate yourself on, but it's external, it represents the possible, all the possibilities of action. That's contrasted with what's called an egocentric representation, where you're just representing the landmarks uh, and how, the, how uh, uh, space is seen by, by you. So it provides an allocentric uh, representation, of, of space. Now, I will note and set aside that during the uh, rest of the 20, 20th century and sometime, somewhat into the 21st century, there's been a hot dispute between mammalian, or between rodent researchers and human researchers of what the hippocampus is really involved in. The rodent researchers arguing that it's playing this role in navigation, and the human researchers arguing no, it plays a role in episodic memory formation. Uh, uh, much of this, uh, much of this of it has gone out of this controversy and there's actually ways to see uh, the, the research is linked. But I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to stay with the road report for today's talk. Well, what's the uh, evidence that these cells represent? Well, the data that uh, uh, O'Keefe started, had started to collect was that as, a cell, as an animal is navigating an enclosure, so here we have a, a, a square enclosure, the black line is a trace of the, of the uh, rats motion through the enclosure. Uh, the red dots represent the location the animal is at when, this, when the individual neuron, which is being recorded from, uh, is, a list, is exhibiting action potentials. And as you can see, although there are a scatter of, of other places that elicit activity, most of the time when this neuron is active, the rodent is in the area indicated by red on the map. Uh, but what O'Keefe then wanted to know is, are these really representing place? Uh, is that what it's signaling? Is it signaling uh, abstract information such as place itself? Or does the cell, or, and if so, how does the cell identify a place? Uh, does it do so on the basis of a special set of cues, or will any cue do? Now notice, if a special cue were involved, you might argue instead that what it represents is not place, but that cue. Um, so, uh, part of the effort was to try to figure out well, uh, what is the basis for this animal, for, for this cell responding in the animal in a particular location. So, the strategy is going to be manipulate what it's supposed to represent, that is, uh, the uh, sensory cues. And what they uh, discovered was that radical changes. Here, here's a situation where there's a uh, radio arm that is in the um, um, center of the enclosure. There's a curtain represented by the squiggly lines. It's in a room, um, although most of that room is invisible to the, to the rat on, on the, in the maze. Uh, and there are there are symbols on the uh, curtain. Uh, uh, and uh, so O'Keefe okay, started manipulating those things, like uh, what happens if you remove the curtain? Well, that disrupts the activity of the, of the place cells. 
What happens if the cars are removed? Well, unless you remove all four, then the, the, the place cell is continuing to fire. But you're going to remove any three. What well, FBA suggests it's not representing a particular cube, it's representing the place itself. That's the thing that's constant through these representations. Okay. That's the situation that O'Keefe set up uh, with his work in, in the 1970s. And then the next step of the work that I'll come to now is a whole host of studies following very much the vein I just sketched of exploring how you change what the representation is supposed to be of and, and study when that changes the activity of the cell, which is the vehicle of representation, uh, and when it doesn't. Uh, these became known as remapping studies because the question is, when does the, the um, activity of the place cells have to be restructured because you are creating a map for a new environment? Uh, so what kind of um, changes will lead to the uh, changes in the, in the behavior of the cell? Uh, and in uh, one of the earlier uh, versions of the study, we were including, uh, 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 we introduced the, the notion of remapping. Uh, uh, took a, here a circular enclosure where we have a given neuron that's responding mostly when uh, in this lower quadrant. They shift the enclosure around the platform, the, uh, the, the area that's enclosed, and if you note, know, then the cell res responds to a different location. So it seems to be uh, responding to the location in relation to the cue card. So that's one kind of remapping. It's now remapping its environment because the reference symbol, the key card, has been removed. Uh, in a uh, further study, you know, asked what, what ha they asked what happens if you remove the cue card. So in, these, in the next two lines, the cue card is present. There's a uh, these are two different cells that each have a region that they fire in re relation to the cue card. Cue card is removed. The uh, uh, activity uh, is now distributed far more widely over the uh, enclosure. Cucumber is restored, and you more or less get back the, the uh, responsivity that you had before. And then yet another kind of manipulation, they expanded or contracted the enclosure and uh, uh, observed that uh, what happens to the uh, uh, responsivity of cells, in fact, they, uh, the fields to which they respond, the fields in space to which they respond, expand and contract. This set off a whole host of other studies. And one of the things that really impressed me as I went through this literature is just how convoluted the, re the research got as people tried various manipulations. One lab would try a manipulation, another lab would seemingly be doing the same manipulation and get the opposite results, except that it was something a little different that they did. But the question was, what kind of structure what was going on here? So things like changing the size of the key card uh, produced remapping, changing its color, did not. Uh, how, you know, why is it this kind of difference? Sometimes you can introduce something else into the task, like a fear conditioning situation, and that may or may not, depending on which what the manipulation is resulting in remapping. So as I said, studies that seem to vary in uh, ways that weren't obvious would produce uh, uh, very different results. For instance, turning lights off left the map in place. But putting the rat in a familiar place before the lights are turned on in the dark caused green uh, wait, well, wait a minute, it's the same place. What, what, is, what, what is going on? Uh, I could spend the whole hour taking you through lots of these studies, but I don't think that's what you came for. Uh, so uh, I will cut to the chase. And in 2005, the Mojo Lab, uh, Gelbs in the Mosher Slab uh, offered a way to cut through at least a large percentage of the variability. They introduced the idea that maybe there's two kinds of remapping. After all, it could be a change in the cell that responded, that's what's called global remapping, or it could be a change in the rate that the cell fires at, what they call uh, rate remapping. Um, well, it's only changing its rate, that means that it's, uh, uh, the cell is, that the rate is changed in light of cues other than the actual location, uh, whereas 
because it's a different cell firing, it's reflecting a different location. That will become important that, that rate may not be uh, crucial to the vehicle that's representing the space. So if you keep the enclosure in the same room, but change its shape or color, you only get remapping. I mean, rate remapping. Those are, that is, some of the cues have now changed. Whereas, you move the enclosure into another room, in this, in this case, the enclosure is not sufficient to block out the room, well, then that leads to global remapping. So, this is beginning to, to make sense of the difference, but no, we're doing this by, again, focusing on the content, changing the content, and trying to make sense of what uh, these cells are representing. With this in mind, O'Keefe and uh, uh, initiated uh, a set of studies that said, well, what happens if we do something fairly round? We're going to change a square enclosure into a circular one, and vice versa. We're going to square the circle here. But we do this by having a, a, a device where we can gradually move the walls until you move, take what was a square into a circle. And in the initial uh, 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 study, they found that when the rat was in the two locations, initially it seemed to treat them the same, but over several days they began to uh, represent them differently. And in a follow-up study, what they did is they actually then put the rat in the enclosure and changed the walls. And they noted that it, you know, it appeared, uh, you can see up at the top on the left, the enclosure is square. On the right, the enclosure is circular. They're just going through a gradual set of, of changes. And what they noted was that the cells seem to have a point where they abruptly change from the representation they used for the square enclosure to the square to the representation they used for the circular enclosure. You look at the lines of light at the top, you basically see that the cells are basically silent when they're in a squarish enclosure, and suddenly a pattern reach um, uh, individual cell emerges as it's in the circular approach. Now, the Lithgow said did a, a similar study at about the same time, uh, but they found a very different pattern. They found a gradual shift as you move from one enclosure to the other. What gives? Why is it that one got, got a abrupt change, one got a uh, gradual change? Well, they went back and commented on the methodology of the O'Keefe group. They're not criticizing, they're noting the difference. The O'Keefe group actually had started in a situation in which the two enclosures, before they started morphing them, had been um, of different color and material. Well, that may mean that what O'Keefe is doing is inducing global remapping, that is, different cells become involved, Whereas the lip gels, who have never had the rats in that kind of situation, are inducing only the gradual change because all they're uh, doing is changing, uh, uh, they're getting what they call uh, uh, rate right now. Now, what I want to press here is that um, uh, this whole research directed at trying to figure out how local space is being um, um, remapped only makes sense, it would only be a sensible project if you're thinking in a representational framework. Uh, uh, that what was happening was that the content of the representations was changing, and the challenge of the researchers was to figure out how these contents uh, uh, could be changed. Uh, and it's, the whole research is driven by questions about representation. It's not a real loss at this point. It's rather the mechanism is viewed as creating and, and operating on representations. Okay, so I pressed that line, but what I want to now look at is how this changes over time. And one uh, important uh, piece of the change was asking, what's the vehicle itself? All I've talked about is whether a cell is firing or not, uh, but it turns out that the picture is considerably more complicated than that. Already at the time, uh, O'Keefe had been doing his studies uh, that identified place cells. Uh, Rank had been doing a set of studies that led to the identification of a different set of cells in the hippocampus uh, that create uh, uh, theta rooms. 
Theta rhythms are rhythms of 8 to 12 hertz. Uh, they're um, uh, measured with what field potentials or, with, or sometimes with EEG. Uh, their oscillation in the electrical potentials uh, 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 across membranes. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, Rank had identified these cells that he called uh, theta cells. And what he had observed uh, was that the cells that Keith had called place cells actually fire as at a typical point in the theta room. Uh, uh, and it tended to be in phase with the theta activity. Now what Rank was doing was actually averaging over many recordings and then showing the average corresponding to the uh, undergoing oscillation, ongoing oscillation in, in theta waves. Okay, what to make of that? Nobody made much of it for a while until in 1990, Okita uh, comes back on the scene uh, on this question, and what he did was now, instead of looking at average results, he looked at individual firing activity, and he looked at uh, the firing activity of, of, of place cells uh, over several episodes of, of that place cell fire. I just put the, the rat is in a particular location, it fires, it fires again, it fires again, and he compared those to the theta level. And something interesting that he recognized. Um, the first, uh, as um, Rank had noted, the theta rhythms, the uh, oscillation, seems, uh, the firing seems to be in phase with the theta rhythms, but in particular, the first burst always tends to occur at a peak in the theta rhythm. So you have in the third line there, the ongoing theta, and in the uh, first and second line, recording from two place cells. Uh, but each successive burst would occur earlier in the theta cycle, um, so that by the time if the rat went all the way through the place field, by the last time it was in the place field, it had actually what's called precessed uh, one whole theta cycle. And what he recognized is that this timing information actually provides a lot more detail than we just have with the spiking information. In particular, when the spike occurs related to theta is a specification of how far into the place, place field the rat has moved. So we now have a much finer resolution. It's not just the whole place field, but where in the place field or for how long the rat has, tra has been traversing the place field. Now looked at an individual cells, that may not sound like all that much, it's just a more refined representation. But actually if you move now from the individual cell to the population, you realize it's a lot more information. Because if you look at several different cells that have somewhat different place fields, uh, it will have precessed more than some, um, um, like, uh, some of those cells will have precessed more than others. And now, from looking at the population, you have not just where the rat is, but where it has been, and potentially, in fact, where it is headed. Uh, uh, so we have rather information contained in the, in the place cells, not just actual uh, current uh, lo location information. Uh, uh, so, we, so we're reaching the, the uh, the uh, vehicle and allowing for it to carry um, uh, more content. And we started to look at this and say, well, actually, who's the consumer of this information? Well, one consumer may be right in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is not just responding to things that's already learned, it's learning to respond in new environments. And uh, uh, the process that it uses, I'm not going to uh, come back to it in a moment, I'm not going to say a lot about it, but it's a changing of of, uh, of uh, uh, the connectivity between neurons and responsiveness to uh, uh, trans neurotransmitters called uh, long-term potentiation uh, 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 only operates when a cell and another, one cell is firing, two cells are firing, and one cell is firing in a close proximity to the one to which it's connected. Um, and so this uh, precession information uh, may be important for helping to uh, allow the rat to learn the environment. Uh, uh, so what, we, what this line of research has done is it's provided a way of, of uh, uh, studying the, the uh, vehicle of representation and showing that, in fact, there's more to the vehicle than we had initially looked at. When we looked at spikes, 
Now we're looking at it in relation to something that's going on endogenously, the fate of in the cells. Uh, and it allows for more content uh, to be represented. In driving the same thing I've been driving with previous work, it, um, um, it's the idea of, the, of these cells as representation is actually foundational to this work. Uh, the whole work, the whole research is, is directed at understanding what's the vehicle of representation and how is it, uh, uh, what, and what content is being represented. Okay, so, so far my focus has been on uh, the cells in the hippocampus, and I've talked as if there's just one population of cells. Uh, but if you're uh, looking at something that's uh, representing information, you want to understand not just what's represented by these things, but where is it getting information from to do this, and where is it sending the information to? Because you need to know more than the, the discrete cells. So, Research, especially in the last uh, 15 years, has really helped expand this and has allowed us to look at uh, networks of, of areas that are communicating with each other. It's different cell types that are carrying different information, different representational information, and you can start to ask what kind of comment explains the uh, creation and then transformation of representations through the system. Um, so, begin with, stay with the hippocampus itself. Uh, place cells have been identified at least in these three areas, CA1, CA3, uh, and then take gyrus. Uh, but interestingly, despite the fact that in the initial studies people didn't pay a lot of attention to which area they were reporting from, uh, the areas respond differently. That is, the cells in the area are not all doing the same thing. Uh, in particular, uh, cells in CA3 uh, uh, show the mapping when there's a change to a different room, uh, uh, or, in, or in when you change the shape of the animal's enclosure. Cell CA1 uh, only remaps when both are changed. Well, that suggests that these remapping studies refined now to these different populations of cells will tell us something different about what's actually being represented. And if you look at the time frame of remapping, they're starkly different. CA3 is earlier in the pathway, uh, but it takes 20 to 30 minutes to carry out its remapping. CA1, thought to be later in the pathway, basically remaps instantaneously. Oops, that can't quite be right because the chain where you're getting information from must have changed first. Well, I said earlier at the very beginning, there's actually a, a shortcut that goes directly from natural rhino cortex uh, to the CA1 fields, and what that suggests is that when CA1 is remapping, it may not be going through the loop through uh, uh, the dentate gyrus and CA3, but rather responding directly uh, to the natural rhino cortex. Uh, so we're beginning to ask whether we have multiple pathways here and what the possible meaning of these pathways are. I have to introduce one further complication into the behavior of these cells. I introduced beta rhythms earlier. Uh, in uh, work on EEG and then on, on uh, about the field potentials, uh, uh, the name of the rhythm refers to the frequency at which it's, which it's occurring. So theta in hippocampus refers to rhythms of 8 to 12 hertz, but there's also detectable rhythms at above 30 hertz, which, which, are, um, which have been labeled gamma rhythms. And in fact, there are two uh, sources of gamma rhythm in the hippocampal area. Uh, one is the uh, entorhinal cortex, which exhibits uh, uh, relatively fast gamma rhythms, called fast gamma, uh, above 60 hertz. And DG, uh, which uh, exhibits uh, rhythms below 60 hertz. And it turns out, oh, OK, I should say one more thing about this. These rhythms are important for a reason I had to up with, and that is when two cells are synchronized in their sub uh, sub or sub uh, threshold sub spiking uh, electrical potentials, when they're synchronized, a spike from one is more likely to produce a spike in the other than when they're not synchronized. One way to think about this is uh, the electrical potential of the recipient cell will also want close to threshold at the point it receives the incoming spike to uh, to generate a spike. 
Uh, so who's synchronized with who affects who's responding to who. And it turns out that uh, uh, when you look at theta, which is the main um, red line there, uh, and you're looking at cells in CA1, uh, at uh, different points in the theta, um, they will be synchronized with the natural right cortex, that is a trough of theta, but on the declining uh, uh, part of the uh, theta wave, uh, they're, they're, they're synchronized with CA3. The way you start thinking about this is that different synchronizations are switching the, the input um, uh, to CA1. So at some points it's in communication primarily with uh, uh, the entorotic cortex, other times uh, with, with CA3. Um, now, see, I, I said at the very beginning that the hippocampus initially attracted attention because it has such a clear architecture. And one of the distinctive features of the architecture is that the CA3 fields have recurrent connections, that is, connections between individual cells in CA3 back onto themselves and into other CA3 cells. Uh, people who think about network organization and what it's good for will very instantly re realize we have a network structure here which is a, a good for creating attractors in space, that is, uh, ability uh, to, to uh, uh, take an um, input and, and, and link it to other inputs that are similar uh, by recognizing the similarity between them. And so CA3 uh, uh, cells will, will if, uh, if a tractor has been formed, settle into it. Also realize that settling into a tractor takes time. It takes uh, uh, going through these, these cycles. Uh, whereas, uh, and if there is no attractor that's, that these cells in CA3 can recognize, then they have to form a new attractor. So we have an extinctive feature of the CA3 cells, um, and when you compare, link that to, the, to CA1, which is receiving the input from CA3, uh, when, it's, when we're doing the slow down on CA1 is linked to CA3, and its response will be determined by the activity in CA3, which, if it recognizes this as an old pattern, will reinstate the same uh, pattern into CA1. When synchronized with, with the interline cortex, and it will do that when, especially, CA3 has not settled into an established attractor, then it's going to be responding to the distinctive features of the, of the new situation. So we have a, a system whereby it's not only um, uh, gaining information to sometimes respond to one thing and another, but it's getting different information. It's getting the information as processed by CA3 or the raw information as it had been in the natural cortex. And so the last piece that fills out this story um, as, at least as it's understood today, is that uh, uh, the process of learning, which I briefly alluded to, long-term potentiation, uh, has also been uh, identified as typically occurring in the trough of the theta cycle. So, uh, so starting on the right over here, when theta is at the peak, there's no uh, 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 long-term potentiation is actually long-term uh, uh, potentiation, but I'm not going to say anything about that. But at that point, when it's at the peak, uh, 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 CA3 has successfully recognized the pattern, sent its input over to CA1, uh, which then uh, sends, sends its output back. But when uh, you, uh, 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 input is at the trough of the theta cycle. That's the period in which LTP can occur, but it's also the period when the intrarenal cortex uh, is directly feeding the activity in CA1. Uh, so we have here a mechanism that I wanted to come in and give you a very brief introduction to, but a mechanism which gates learning. Learning should occur when I have something to learn, and not when I'm recognizing something I've already learned before. I don't want to overwrite my current memories if it's something I already know, but if it's something new, I need, I need to learn it. 
Um, and so what we, what I've briefly uh, tried to have shown here is that this research, by looking at different areas, is beginning to put together a processing story of how representations, they're all going to be place, place cells, but the representations uh, are slightly different in them, and we have a story about how one set of representations is dependent upon, or not dependent upon, another set of representations in the processing system. Okay, so here's the last main wrinkle to the, to the whole story. Um, uh, if place cells are representing place, they must be getting the information from somewhere. Uh, they're not just out there, at, you know, they're not sensory organs that are detecting place uh, from the world. And all of their inputs are coming from, it's not quite true, but most of their inputs are coming from the entorhinal cortex, and a particular part of the entorhinal cortex, the medial entorhinal cortex. Um, and so people interested in these representations ask, well, what's going on at the, at the previous step? What are they representing? Well, you find people in the 1990s already found cells in the medial and cortex that seem to be responsive to places, but not in a very clear pattern. And in fact, the same cell might respond to this place, this place, and this place, but that didn't seem very simple. You know, there wasn't um, any distinct pattern. And the idea was, well, okay, you know, somehow information is being carried by these cells about place, that's not what they're really representing. It's the formation of the representation that occurs in the hippocampus itself. But then in 2004, um, uh, in the Mojo lab in, in, uh, uh, in Norway, uh, uh, they found cells in the uh, medial and toronto cortex that had, as they reported, sharp and coherent place feelings that were clearly delineated. So they're starting to say, wait a minute, place may be represented here in the New York entorhinal cortex. But the problem still was that several different locations would elicit activity in the same place field, or in the same entorhinal cortex. Uh, is there any pattern to that? Well, in 2005, a year later, they discovered that there indeed was a very clear pattern up to them. You just had to record it right away from a large enough enclosure. This diagram ought to be familiar in that the black line is the uh, rat navigating in the enclosure, but now notice that the reporting from one place, uh, one um, interactive cortex cell, uh, and there are multiple places that it elicits activity, but if you look, they, each three places forms a triangle, or if you look at this one here uh, in the second row in the center, you notice that the uh, ones around it form a uh, this led uh, them, the Mosher's to characterize uh, these cells as grid cells. Apparently there's a grid that an individual cell has put out there in the world that will respond whenever um, uh, the rat is at a junction in that grid. Um, uh, and then the question was, well, wait a minute, now we've got two populations of cells. We have all that hippocampus population over here, but what are these cells doing and how do they behave? Recipe books already have been created, start doing things like studying their map. Well, quickly you discover, and, and, and things like phase perception. perception. Now, these cells also exhibit phase perception, just like the animal cells. They do exhibit global remapping, but they don't exhibit great remapping. Just as a reminder, global remapping is when different cells fire to the, to the uh, in different uh, enclosures. Uh, right in that means when you change features of the enclosure, uh, so they're not uh, seemingly influenced much by features. Another difference between them and grid cells is that um, in the hippocampus, each location gets its own uh, map. So if two cells are, are, are reflecting areas near each other in one enclosure, in another enclosure they may not show any such relationship. That's not true in the interrhinal cortex. The uh, relation amongst the place fields for an individual cell will remain constant across the uh, environments. And these cells quickly form a map when the, uh, when the organism is in a new environment. 
Um, so we have now a whole new population of cells seemingly involved in something like the same activity. The question is, so to speak, are we going to tease these apart? What's going on? Well, part of the interest turned immediately to this little phenomenon that I haven't alluded to yet, uh, but it uh, is, is uh, clear both in place cells and in these grid cells, and that is uh, that if you have a rat navigating when all the cubes have been removed, uh, it's, it's in, and there's no odors, there's no odor cubes, there's no uh, tactile cubes, uh, and no light cubes, uh, the cells continue to update to the new location. And place cells do that, uh, and enterrhinal cube uh, cells do that. Now how can, we, how can the location on the map be updated if you have no new cubes? Well, you need to know where you, what rate, rate you're going and what speed and what direction you're going. Uh, and so the question is, how would rats be able to know that? Well, they must have cells that report both uh, uh, rate and uh, direction of motion. Uh, and then they integrate that. That process is called path integration. Integrate the information about uh, your, uh, your location, your velocity, and your direction to come up with your new location. And uh, place cells do that, but seemingly these, these grid cells do it as well. That asks where are you getting the rate information from? Where are you getting the, head, uh, the, the uh, direction information from? Well, one of those we can answer, one we can't, or the researchers can answer, but they can't. There is a population of cells that rank it, actually, this study itself, um, that are called head direction cells. And if you remember that first um, uh, paper by O'Keefe, the rat had to be uh, facing in a particular direction. Now, that didn't appear in any of the other discussion of place cells, uh, but these head direction cells do respond particularly to a direction. So if you see in here, we've got a uh, rat facing uh, a cue card on the wall, and only when it's facing it do you get a, uh, a much of a spike, or you get a primary spike when it's directly facing it, and it's a Gaussian distribution uh, around the, the spiking uh, location. Um, so it, um, these cells are what Ryan called head direction cells. Um, and in fact, they also update um, in the absence of any, any new cues. So if the rat is shifted in location in, in, the, in the enclosure, uh, they update. They do, once, once the cues are available again, they will correct for any um, in inaccuracy, you can you can experience this yourself. Blindfold yourself and try to turn to face something, and you'll get close. And when you can see, you'll adjust. That's exactly what these cells seem to be doing. Okay, I put them these cells, the head direction cells, in here uh, because what we're now getting is a whole network of different types of cells, head direction cells, in addition to uh, uh, place cells and grid cells. And in particular, it turns out that head direction cells, uh, while they were initially found elsewhere, are also found in the interrhinal cortex, interspersed with grid cells, interspersed with cells that respond to both location and uh, head direction, integration. Now, I'm not saying anything about how this integration is, is performed, but it looks like we have a set of cells that are doing exactly uh, what we need of integration of integration of integration of integrating information about uh, at least uh, direction and location. And it turns out these cells are also modulated in their firing rate by uh, velocity. But how that is done, I don't think it's understood at this point. What have I done? I just shifted what we thought we were talking about with, grids, with place cells to grid cells. That leaves a nice question. What were those grids? What were those place cells doing to begin with? Well, they do something that the grid cells don't do. They change their behavior, that is the firing rate, dependent upon cues 
Rickshaw seemed to be ignoring cues. What might be done with the cue information? Well, here's a hypothesis that what the cue information is doing is allowing for the correction of the grid cell representation. That perhaps the grid cell representation is the primary one for, for representing place. Uh, and the hippocampal structure is integrating that information with information about from cues and feeding back into the interrhinal cortex with an update saying, no, you're not quite where you think you are, you're a little bit off. And all of us who uh, uh, aren't perfect navigators discover this every once in a while, that we look out and the world isn't what we expected it to look like while we're driving, uh, and we have to figure out what we just do. Um, so what I've been doing here is, is, is defined, describing the research that went from just one, little, one representer of place cells to multiple kinds of place cells to now grid cells, head direction cells, and also what are called boundary uh, cells and other uh, specialized space represented cells. And I'm emphasizing that these are part of a network of cells with related but different representational that sets up an obvious question to somebody who's thinking about these as representations. How are they being transformed one into the other? Um, well, that's a pro that takes a different kind of research that I've been talking about. Most of that work is done by developing mathematical models that then try to uh, uh, characterize how one set of representations could generate a population with another set of representations. Uh, and there's act, uh, an active, ongoing work all through this period that we're talking about, trying to develop processing models to go along with uh, the account of, of representation that I've been emphasizing. So what I've been trying to do is push very strongly the claim that uh, those representation aren't losses. They are the focus of, of, of the research. Uh, we're trying to understand how the representations get formed, uh, how they're transformed in one, into one another, how con what the vehicle actually is, how it carries information about a uh, particular context. And these are the hypotheses that guide the research and then get uh, uh, revised in the, in the course of research. Uh, this kind of research makes all kinds of sense um, if we're thinking about the system as part of a control system allowing the rat to navigate. As part of that kind of system, the components of it need different pieces of information. They need it represented in a way that they can make use of, just as Watt had to re-represent the speed of the, uh, of, the, of the engine in a form that it could be used to control the, the steam valve. So does the, uh, uh, do these representations need to be transformed into the right representations for the controller to do its work. Okay, thank you so much. All right, well, we've got plenty of time for questions, so. <laughs> so, any questions? Enclosure. And you know that if you take it from one enclosure to another, 
Well, it's very unnatural. You're right. But you, uh, I'll give you a more natural one in just a moment. But in the two enclosures, it has very different types. Uh, same cells, same population of cells, but their uh, way of representing that enclosure is very different than the way of representing this enclosure. That suggests that maybe it's like uh, in those, uh, I don't know if London has, has them, but big cities have these map books where you have each part of the city in a small, on uh, uh, one page, and you know, there's, so it has uh, this part of the sewer system, but then this other part of the sewer system, and this other part, and then somehow has to have a way to connect up the maps. That's a possibility. Another uh, possibility is that in a larger enclosure, it just has a much more, you know, the boundaries of all as part of a, a common map. I think the evidence points more toward the former than the latter of those hypotheses. And one piece of that is that you can actually set up two locations with a connection between So the rat actually can go between the two locations. And there you do get two different mapping systems uh, in the hip campus. Uh, now, given that the role of hip campus is not to be the primary designator of space used for all kinds of navigational functions, but is an updater of the representations that are elsewhere, that would be that would make sense that it's got a take, you know, it's got a specialized map for this location, and that's possible to link it to cues about that location that it's experienced in the past, and it can update any inaccuracies of this navigation to write as an internal map. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean there's no way. In fact, there is light in uh, the rights to that visual processing, otherwise we wouldn't use them for a lot of visual research, uh, but it's Yeah. 
took a heuristic kind of understanding of representation and looked at it in terms of, okay, this is all just simply mechanical. You know, there's nothing about anything here. What we have are structural recapitulations of, you know, various features of the environment. And to talk about information about is just simply a convenient shorthand that humans use, humans need, in order to effectively cognize this information. Wouldn't that still give you the, the kind of method of discovery that you're arguing here, the, the Boltzmann versus Mock type uh, argument where <clears throat> you, know, you argue for, uh, uh, against the phenomenal approach that like Van Gelder's in, in favor for something that actually theorizes ontological entities such as representations. I mean, wouldn't the description I gave you give you both? It could allow you to say, look, representations is just simply a heuristic that we use. It's all really just mechanical, but it's a very useful one just simply because it picks up on enough real patterns. But the mechanics are interesting. And there's a reason why most of the scientists are not going to be instrumentalists about this. They're, they're going to be realists about it. The, mechanical, the, the mechanism they're interested in is the mechanism that allows the internal states to track as well as they do the, the, what, it, what they're supposed to be about. They're interested in that about this relation. They're interested in how it, how it is that these cells connect up to places in the environment uh, and provide information about it. Uh, you can say, well, I don't really want to call that representation. I'm just glossing the mechanism. But it's not glossy. I mean, it, it's more than glossy. It's, it's uh, like I say, it still gives you a method of discovery. So it's not just simply a gloss. It's not just simply a way of talking about these things. It's actually a way to dig into things and discover new things. But at the same time, it is still heuristic insofar as it picks out, uh, picks out a certain information structure in the environment and kind of lets the rest of the stuff fade in the background and makes for more efficient cognition of whatever it is, just given our human implications. Yeah, I agree. So many things are heuristic. That's not where I'm going to fuss about it, but, and, and, and in fact, we pick out certain things to try to figure out and treat it as noise, uh, lots of variability that we don't yet know what to do with. The stuff about the relation to theta, well, it wasn't perfectly related to theta, uh, but we treated it as noise, and then figure out, oh no, in fact, that relation uh, is far more informative than we thought it than we thought it was to begin with. Um, and so the question is, what's at stake between whether you think there really are representations or it's a useful way to think in order to understand the system? I just don't know what's at stake. You know, in that kind of issue, I'm not sure really what's at stake. Uh, you're going to uh, uh, your question to me, does the evidence bear up to the account I'm giving of how the, of how the system uh, uh, behaves. I'm putting out falsifiable hypotheses. Uh, and I think the place cell hypothesis was a false hypothesis, but a, but a very useful hypothesis, and that what research has done is corrected. Well, that's a natural way of characterizing this as a realist, but I, uh, I realized that this while it was useful for, for uh, giving us a degree of understanding, now needs to be uh, changed because that's not the way uh, these things operate. These cells operate in a different way than, than our initial uh, characterization. So I see, I think there's a, here's a, a somewhat different way to get at the issue. Lots of mechanisms in the world you know, there are no mechanisms in the world. There's lots of, um, of mechanisms that are not information processing mechanisms. Uh, they, 
lots of little complex, interesting properties. Uh, but they, so uh, my favorite biochemical reaction, which I'm going to enjoy in a little bit of time, fermentation, uh, uh, is not an information processing mechanism. It's, it's, it's a um, metabolic process to extract energy, even though it may do some other nice things uh, as well. Uh, um, we are, we're not going to identify some, some processes in, in the uh, fermentation, fermentation story as representations, whereas we need to do that when we're dealing with control systems. By the way, I don't know whether there are only representations in control systems where one compresses any control system, does need representations. That is, these things that stand in the right relation to the environment. And that's the commitment, I think, that one has when one starts to think of this system as controlled. And, and I guess it's just really a question of how you characterize that, <coughs> that relation, how you characterize it. In semantic terms, you characterize it in causal terms. And, and well, uh, I think you, you know, if semantics is going to work here, there's going to have to be causal relations that are supporting it, but not all. Causal 
eight years is a long time in the history of science, but still, I don't know what that question is. The why grid structure, part of that answer that we might involve learning more about biology, uh, uh, how this, where the system comes from, uh, uh, where it was first introduced into uh, organisms, and is it really an optimal solution? Is it the only solution? Uh, or is it the first? Did it get entrenched and left behind? Never. 
Yeah, we were saying more micro, and we use that for building memory structures elsewhere. Thank <laughs> you. 